<laughs> You're right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. You separated those. I wasn't. Uh, okay. We're all right. This segment just won't go anywhere. Um, but I do that just because I like publishing four or five times a day. Now, if there is breaking news, I publish it. Sure. You know, like if, if I come up with something or the city sends me something, the county, so on and so forth, I don't wait for a time to get that kind of urgent news out to the public. You know, I, I go ahead and, uh, you know, put it out there. Uh, now, I also this weekend wrote an open letter about an, an anonymous letter. Um, about a, a little more than a week ago, an anonymous letter came out uh, that really desecrated my dear friend, Denny Magruder. I didn't think it was fair. I saw a bit of that. Yeah, I, I didn't think that was fair. Uh, I've known Denny my whole life. Well, and, and he had a lot of support after that. Of course. Um, I've known him my whole life, all the way back to the St. Mike's days. Okay? He's got, uh, you know, his daughter is Jennifer and Terry, his son Rob. I, I went to St. Mike's. They're younger than I. Terry by a year, Jennifer, I think, by four or five. Um, but I, I've known that family my whole life. And I have only in my entire life seen both Denny Magruder and his beautiful bride, his wife, support the youth of this area. Okay? I've never known Denny Magruder to make a decision that would damage something pertaining to the youth in this area. Okay, you read that letter and somebody, well, I, I, I haven't seen the letter. Why don't you publish the letter? I'm not publishing the letter. It's nothing but lies. Okay, you got a snippet. You got the beginning um, as the cover photo, for goodness sake. You know, seek it out. Do your research um, because I won't promote that letter. I, it was mean-spirited. It was full of untruths, um, misinformation. And I, I honestly, truly believe that it... Uh, that a public apology signed public apology and not some an, an, another anonymous letter needs to be made See, to saw, Denny McGruder. I saw it was anonymous, but then I also saw it was from like a um, some kind of organization. Oh, it's a great organization. Or... Waha is terrific. Okay, what Waha is, and it's been around for a long time, um, it's a youth hockey organization. Okay, when I was a kid, I had a lot of friends playing Waha. Terri that's how old this thing is. Okay. And I think that organization is getting kind of, what's the word? Um, you know, they're, they're in the middle of this unfairly. Okay, whoever wrote the anonymous letter to Waha families, um, they put Waha in the middle of it, and that's unfair. An apology to Waha should be made too. Is it just a big fan? I don't know. I don't know who it is. Um, but whomever it is needs to apologize very, very, very publicly and sign it. You know, I mean, be brave, not a coward. Sign it. Just the way it's supposed to go. So, uh, oh, by the way, there's a business for sale down in South Wheeling, South Wheeling Grocery. Oh, cool. Why don't you, why don't, why don't you and Alex go grab that, too? I think we have our hands full. But you never know. I'm sorry, I had to communicate with Erica. Um, yeah, you never know. I mean, it, it reminded me of the minute market. You know, when I was a kid, and hi, Sharon, hi, Scott. Um, when I was a kid, uh, my mom would write on a piece of paper, hand me $2, and on the piece of paper it would say, please sell my my son one pack of Terrington 100s. Yeah, yeah you could get a pack of smokes for your parents. And she would sign it. <laughs> and, you know, here I am, Annie M, on my huffy, right? Because I got the quarter. I get the quarter, okay? And, yeah, I'm 54, so a quarter used to be kind of a bigger deal than it is today. Oh, absolutely. Um, you could actually get stuff for that. Um, so I got the extra quarter, and I'm like, yeah. So, I, I, like I said, Annie M, I'd go, I'd go get it and get the pack of cigarettes, get my quarter, pick out what I wanted. And then I Annie M'd all the way back home on my huffy, and I'd deliver those cigarettes to my mom. And, uh, and then I'd go back out with that quarter or whatever I bought with it. And it was just, uh, you know, those kind of things. You can't do that anymore. But when I walked in South Wheeling Grocery, it reminded me of the Minter Market. Now, the Minter Market had more. Sure. Okay. Um, you know, the, the lady with uh, South Wheeling Grocery, Lisa Minder, 
um, she she tried to have pretty much the same inventory that what the minute market had, but people weren't buying fresh foods. It, it's a hard market. You know, at the end of the day, I think a lot of those kinds of establishments live off of the lottery, um, tobacco and alcohol sales, and um, just small impulse buys. Mm-hmm. But we certainly here in the Valley need more places where you can buy baby formula, diapers, pet supplies. I mean, you can't get a bag of dog food on the island right now. You know, I know. There, there's a lot of That's things. why A&J's, man, it's going to be big for the people on the island, I'm telling it, you. It really is. What what Alex and Dolph are doing for the island, bringing that back is going to keep people from walking across the bridge. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I I'm a, I was always a big fan of A&J's. I think I told you that before. Um, you know, it's right by the ball field. I was always on a ball field. Um, no, I, I love that. But it's on sale. Lisa ha- Lisa's now going back to China. It's really a neat story. Lisa and her husband and their son, Will, they separated because Will needed medical care he couldn't get in China. So Lisa brought her son, Will, here. He's got the treatment and everything. He was just released to go back to China. So she opened this place in September, not knowing and now they're allowed to go back. She hasn't seen her husband. Who can blame her for wanting to go back and rejoin the family, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, reunite the family. So they're going back in June. So the South Wheeling Grocery, right along Jacob, down the street from Panhandle Cleaning, um, I think it's just past the old Cooey Bend. Um, but it's for sale. It's, you know, it's 45G. Um, but you get everything in the building. We have a lot of local small businesses up for sale lately i know of yeah. a couple of pizza shops there's a uh, you know a, a lot of room for development for like-minded people now as far as those kind of grocery stores those neighborhood grocery stores i we mentioned aj's we met, mentioned the minute market there was another minute market on wheeling island um and i am told down in south wheeling there was one of these mini grocery stores every other block and that reminds me of Shadeland Avenue up on the north side of Pittsburgh where my grandmother opened her first store. My grandmother's store was a dry goods store, and then she went from there. But it was, you know, Shadeland Dry Goods, and then it was Peggy Ann's Grocery, and then it was... You'd have a fabric store and yeah, a battery store. And- all along Shadeland. You know, neighborhoods used to take care of themselves because back then a car wasn't a given. Well, and, and a lot more got traded, bartered. You know, if True. You, I needed fabric to sew dresses for my daughters, and I had, you know, vegetables I traded. Yeah. But now it's, you got to actually make the sale. So it's a lot of people competing for the same lessening dollar. Right. Right. All right. Um, uh, we're going to go ahead and take the break. I'll get Storch on the phone. Uh, Delegate Erica Storch, a Republican. She uh, represents the third de- uh, delegate district. Do you have any questions for uh, Erica? No. No? No, I, I put all of my faith in our you know, local and regional government to, to do their best work. Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, I'm Steve Novotny. We're going to head on down to Charleston, West Virginia. Charleston, West Virginia, and say hi to our good friend, of course, uh, Delegate Erica Storch, uh, a Republican that represents the 3rd House District. Last time, Erica, the listeners couldn't hear you real well. I'm, I, I'm, I'm confident that we have... Uh, Straighten that situation out. How's Erica today? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I've got several questions for you, but first, um, you know, I I, I, I I liked every one of your mask photos. I know that you are uh, really, really busy, but uh, I do hope that a lot of uh, local businesses and nonprofits from the 3rd District have uh, have sent you their masks. Well, um, I'm trying to purchase all the masks just to, because, you know, I've got to support the small businesses. Right. And um, I have received some, but yes, I'm trying to purchase them all. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And uh, I think you have a really good looking one that you just paid for <laughs> yesterday. True story. Yes, I do. It will be a, a feature later in the week. I actually have to get my photo to my photo today, I um, came down this morning pretty early and there was a pretty bad accident on I-70, which led me to sit and stop traffic for a considerable amount of time. 
And um, I had an early pension meeting scheduled, um, which has led me to just bang, bang, bang. So I'm hoping to get that photo taken shortly. This is a match. My today's mask is a mask that I purchased from Ditto. Um, okay. Delightful, delightful little boutique on National Road. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think that's where Michelle has purchased uh, the majority of her masks. Uh, yeah, and, and I know that your daughter, Alexis, uh, saw Mrs. Novotny uh, there this past yeah. Saturday. <laughs> she did see Mrs. Novotny there this past Saturday. Yeah, big birthday weekend. we have weekend. encouraged her. Big birthday weekend. All right, How but, was it? Oh, it was great. Um, you know, I explained during the first segment, you know, we went to Abby's for dinner. Uh, went to Generations for, uh, you know, a couple of beers and to meet some other people and to hear Jim Bursey. And I was impressed with how both of those businesses are handling what they have to handle at this point in the pandemic. And, uh, no, it was, uh, Michelle had a lot, a lot of fun. She truly did. Good. Yeah, that's what birthdays are all about, in my opinion, anyway. All right, let's get to this, uh, let's get to this regular session. Of course, the uh, the Republicans have super majorities in both chambers. First question, Erica: What are your impressions with the session to this point? Into the going into what the third uh, the third week or so? Um, you know, what what are your impressions? I mean, it's it's still kind of surreal world because you know we don't have the building open. You have to schedule. Um, everybody has access. They're just asking them to schedule before they would come. You know, they don't want you to just wander aimlessly into the building and then, um, you know, walk with your legislator or whatever if your legislator's concerned about their various um, different, you know, with everyone's responding and reacting to this COVID, COVID situation a little differently. And if, you know, if you're not comfortable talking to people generally or interacting or you want to keep your circle pretty small, um, that is taken into consideration. So they're just asking people to schedule. It's actually kind of nice because then you do know when you're going to see people and you can prepare to meet with them at that slotted time. And I've had several meetings, which is you know beneficial to both me to get the information and to those that want to share their information as well. Um, so I'm finding that to be a positive. Um, we're only using two of the larger committee meeting rooms, which is also, I'd say, a positive for the reaction that we need to spread out a little bit more during the session. You know, all the businesses have had to make accommodations, so we can do that with these two meeting rooms. Um, so we are actually going into finance at four, so the time is stretched a little longer or later in the evenings because, you know, we normally use four committee rooms, but when you're squeezing six committees into two committee rooms, then, you know, everyone has to take a turn. But it's, all, it's working pretty well. Okay. All right. What about some of the bills offered and passed and things like that? I saw that the, uh, you know, and I saw you commented on it that, um, you know, Rutgers, uh, you know, she. The, there was a bill that made striking for teachers illegal, and your point, and and what I read was, well, it's already illegal. Tell me what happened to that bill. Well, so that was pulled from. The, so you know, we work off two calendars. We have a special calendar and a house calendar. Um, on Friday, that bill would have been voted on in the House. It's already completed its legislative action in the Senate, but we pulled that back to the House calendar. Um, it still is on the House calendar. I mean, I've gotten some feedback from several that believe that it will help um, help codify what was a Supreme Court ruling in 1990 or 91. Um, I've heard from some that would thought it would help with keeping the the different counties uniform. But I mean, it is currently against the law to strike if you're a public employee because you know they don't want disruption of services. Right. Now, Erica, the, you know, when we did have strikes a couple of years ago, uh, they were referred to as uh, work stoppages, correct? Yes, because so um, in all those instances, the superintendents canceled the school. So that was what led, which honestly is what led to kind of an uproar from the parent community saying, you know, this is, this, we are, a lot of the parents I've heard from are supportive of this piece of legislation. Okay. 
Okay, and one of the strikes was nine days. And uh, I think the uh, second one, Erica, was that just three days, I believe? Oh, they both felt like about nine weeks. Yeah, they did, and it's all over PEIA. And, uh, you know, the governor has frozen that uh, health care system ever since. Is that How long is that fix going to last? Well, um, I mean, he has no plans to to remove that freeze currently. Um, I think we're okay with the money that's coming into PEIA, but like we've talked a couple of times, I mean, assigning a funding source to it, especially if it would be natural gas severance, which has been the vogue thing to say over the past couple of years, would be detrimental because gas is down now. So then we're going to be back at the well again, trying to come up with another funding source. And who knows with the, you know, our current administration, we really don't know if it's going to pick up, honestly. I mean, the the cracker plant across the river has been delayed again. An announcement about that has been delayed again. So, I mean, we're, I think everybody's just kind of waiting and seeing. So, I mean, it's never really a good idea to tie a funding source to a um, mechanism like that outside of, like, premium dollars coming in to cover stuff. That's a whole different animal. No, but, it, you know, I thought you were going to say and connect it to a commodity. That if we've not learned in West Virginia – what a commodity is and how it fluctuates, and of course I'm referencing coal, number one, now natural gas and oil, they're commodities. It goes up and down, and it, it has little to do with what is taking place in the state of West Virginia um, as far as the decrease. Now, if uh, a unit of natural gas falls below $2, where it's been for a little while, um, you know, they're, they're, the investment on the gas and oil companies is going to slow, if not just stop, because it's not worth the investment, because there's a glut, an oversupply of natural gas. Now, this winter, this winter may have changed that for the future, but we have to, we just have to wait and see. You know, and yeah, I mean, it's not a good idea. You're 100% correct. Um and hopefully we can rebound in the valley because it's, you know, so many needed jobs and um, it would give us an opportunity to really have an opportunity or take advantage of the opportunity that has come our way to let West Virginia succeed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Delegate Erica Storch on the program, ladies and gentlemen, Erica is a Republican that represents the third house district. Uh, That district takes up the majority uh, of Ohio County, not all of it. Uh, some of that goes to District 2 uh, up in uh, Brook County. Uh, probably the West Liberty corner uh, goes to... Yep, those uh, two precincts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, House Bill 2500. I'm telling you right now, I do not support it. I pay the user fee, but I do not support this bill because I believe that the current council here in Wheeling has done uh, has used those monies correctly and, and for for pretty good things um, but you know if they keep collecting it and the infrastructure is going to be able to be improved you know the user fee was earmarked for public safety and infrastructure here in the city of Wheeling and you know the the new fire department's going to be finalized soon we know where the new police department both of those uh, first responder departments needed new headquarters and they figured it out and now those departments are getting those I don't support making it or banning user fees in municipalities in the state of West Virginia. Does House, House Bill 2500 have a chance? Well, I really hope not. You know, um, as you know, I've served as the chair of political subdivisions for the last six years, have kept this bill and other bills like this off the agenda um, because I feel like they're detrimental. I feel like they would cause angst and undue hardship and burden on municipalities um as soon you know let's say like my question that wasn't it was pretty accurately relayed in all the media coverage i've seen of it but it was um you know maybe i didn't articulate it quite as well as i could have but as soon as that funding source is jeopardized the bonds are in default so um it's you know (laughs) So it's great to say they want to get rid of these user fees. Well, what municipality doesn't have them bonded if they're doing any road work? I mean, what, who isn't leveraging their money to get the most out of 
you know, the most bang out of their buck. Um, it just, it seems like it's um, self-serving. We all pay a user fee to, um, to work in Charleston. We pay it year round. Um, and I think that's the genesis of it. And um, so this initially was to exempt the state employees. Well, okay, that's, I'm not any more special than anyone else. Right. So I don't think that I need to be exempted from paying that. Um, it does kind of bite when you're paying user fee to the city of Wheeling and the city of Charleston. <laughs> I think they're probably not, you know, they're probably looking at it and thinking it's only $2 or it's only $3 or whatever. And as long as they're able to do good things with it, improve our roads, heck, if I can get the alley paved, the alleys paved in Woodsdale with our user fees, I'll consider it a win because our alleys haven't been paved in a long time. I'm not talking patch, I'm talking paved. I know, um, I know. <laughs> no, I, you know I have the alley. Living in Woodsdale. <laughs> you know I have an alley right next door, and because of the Central Gym and King's Daughters, this alley, you know, I, <laughs> I did a road study once, a traffic study. <laughs> 226 cars in one day go up and down this alley. That's a lot of cars. Yeah, that is. Yeah. So. That is. Uh, hopefully the city manager and the uh, operations director uh, will see fit to, to pave this alley. It's it's needed. It truly is. When a plow, when a plow came through, what, a couple of weeks ago, it took, it took chunks of pavement out. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping. Uh, that uh, that alley does get paid. But I, I see your point, and it's the same point I'm making. As far as infrastructure is concerned, you know, we, we have to replace an entire Mount, you know, uh, Washington Avenue bridge. That's that's not a patching. That's not a, uh, you know, we're going to tweak this thing. That's demo it and put in new, just like the Fulton Bridge on the westbound and eastbound now, the eastbound lanes of I-70. The bridge goes away, a new one gets built. That's how bad it is. Yeah, and that's frustrating because the cities, you know, the municipalities around the state have come up with ways that aren't overly burdensome on their populations. They seem to be equitable and fair with how they're spread amongst those that, you know, come to work in the city. And so to have that resource or those resources available to do the work that's necessary, like you said, we're going to get our police department where they're not eating at their desk on their lunch break, where they previously had fentanyl spread up across That's right. it yeah. because they took it in on intake. So, I mean, it just seems, and honestly, um, sometimes some of people are elected with good intentions and I don't think they necessarily realize the repercussions of either the legislation that they propose or legislation that they end up running. Well, wake them up, Storch, will you? Wake them oh, up. Oh, I'm trying. Hey, uh, it's the, the worst thing to be on the committee. Local newspapers did an editorial and and insinuated that the the super majorities of the Republicans in Charleston are drunk on power. What do you say to that? Oh, there definitely are people that are like that. There definitely are people that are um, are you know going to take advantage of that situation. And there are definitely people that are um, probably feeling a little retaliatory towards behaviors exhibited to them. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably right. Okay. All right. Now, if, I'm not. Well, no, you <laughs> haven't been. Uh, this is your sixth term, and I've not seen that happen. But the emergency powers in a state of emergency of uh, any state governor in West Virginia, now, of course, Governor uh, Jim Justice, that's been a concentration down there. What's going to happen? Well, so this weekend, and I really noticed it on my drive, you know, we got a great deal of rains, which led to melting of snows that had accumulated, which led to a lot of flooding. Oh, yeah. Um, so I, um, you know, the system to exit is closed because just off the ramp, you can't even travel any further than about three quarters of the way down the ramp because of flooding. Oh, wow. So, um, the one thing we don't want is to restrict it so tightly that we would be in Charleston every time there's a flood. Because, as you know, while well, the Northern Panhandle, I mean, at la the, the furthest north I heard 
um, this morning was about Wetzel County, I believe, as far as flooding. Yeah, there was some flooding in Wetzel County. Um, you know, when I was down there working for the Wetzel Chronicle, there was a creek that ran to the river that flooded um, a lot. I mean, pretty frequently. Uh, that's the only creek that I have heard down in Wetzel County in New Martinsville that I'm sure some streams out in the county near Hundred and Pine Grove and places like that did too. Um, but yeah, the, the more south uh, from Wetzel County, it was much, 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 much worse. Right. So we don't want to, you know, whatever we're putting in the code will be applicable um, universally. So we don't want to be called in every time we have flooding in various areas of the state. You know, it's better to let the executive handle that with those local legislators in the region that are affected, as opposed to having, you know, us all come down here to try to make a decision. Um, because, you know, human nature, it's not going to end well uh, for the better betterment of the situation. So I think it's, you know, I think it's pretty decent legislation. Hopefully we can um, get that across the finish line and not have to override a veto. <laughs> right, right, right. All right, uh, the tax plan, uh, the Jim Justice tax plan. He's doing uh, town meetings, electronic town meetings. Um, does, does his plan have a chance, and do you believe taking away the income tax would attract more residents to the state of West Virginia? And, Delegate, you have uh, three minutes to answer. So this is largely on, um, so Brad Smith with, um, yeah, with Brad Smith gave a donation to WBU to uh, try to attract remote workers to the state. So this is, this is like to further that idea. If we can, and to enhance the opportunities for those people that could work for these large companies from wherever they'd like. So they're trying to drive population. I mean, I can Stay cautiously optimistic about the governor's plan, but we haven't seen a plan. We haven't seen numbers. Okay. Um, the governor has changed his his numbers, just the general numbers, a couple times. At one point, the soda pop tax was going to go up nine cents. Now it's going up five cents. So we haven't seen anything to quantify or substantiate what he's discussing or saying is a possibility. And we haven't seen any draft legislation either. So, I mean, it's kind of tough and we're probably a little late. We probably should have had this already a, a while ago <laughs> to, to try to start gaining support. So I'm, you know, I'm staying, I'm not trying to be the hammer. I'm trying to stay cautiously optimistic, but sadly, we don't really have anything to review yet. Do you believe that it would bring, uh, I mean, let's say that you actually think the plan would be okay. Um, I disagree with it, by the way. I'll pay my income tax. But uh, do you think, see, the reason I'm asking, Erica, if this thing is going to bring more residents because, you know, it, it works for Florida. Who wouldn't, you know, who, who wouldn't want to be? I can tell you, I wish I was at spring training right now. Okay? Yeah. I, I do. Okay? Um, you know, Florida is one thing, but West Virginia, uh, do you want to? Uh, do you want to experience the four seasons we do in West Virginia simply because there is no income tax? That I think that's a good question to ask. Right. And I think, I mean, largely, I think the governor believes that we do have a lot of wonderful um, things to offer to people that like might like to enjoy the out of doors. Um, you know, we have snow skiing, we have places you can water ski, we have, places you can whitewater raft. I mean, we have a lot of adventure activities um, if you want to take place or if you want to partake in one of those. Um, so I think that's his idea. But like I said, I want to see numbers. I want to see that Steve and Michelle Novotny on their tax return are going to save X thousands of dollars. And if they have to pay this much more in other taxes, then they're still going to see a net saving that's right, substantial. Right. No, I get it. I did. I get it. All right, uh, delegate. We are out, uh, out of time, but I do appreciate uh, you coming on the podcast a second time, and 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 hopefully you'll continue during the session and and beyond, so you can keep everybody as up to date as possible. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. All right, you be safe down there. I mean that. Okay. Thanks. All right. Delegate Erica Storch, ladies and gentlemen. 
um, of course, here on Steve Novotny Whips. We're going to take a break. When we come back, uh, a friend of mine, John W. Miller, he's the founder of Moundsville.org. He also did a, a PBS movie called Moundsville. John W. Miller joins us next right here on Steve Novotny Lives. Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, I'm Steve Novotny. Hour number two at 4.30, uh, around 4.30, we're going to have Brandon uh, and Melissa Holmes. Uh, they went over to Martins Ferry. I'm going to let them tell the majority of the story, but they went over to Martins Ferry, Ohio, uh, to grab something, and they ended up with a brand new business. So we'll talk to Brandon and Melissa uh, after the 4.30 break. But joining me right now is uh, my friend John W. Miller. John uh, is the founder of Moundsville.org. He's also done a movie, ladies and gentlemen, um, called Moundsville. John, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. Well, speaking of Martin's Ferry, uh, did you know when you went on your food tour this, uh, this past Saturday that, you, number one, you visited the oldest settlement in the state of Ohio, Martin's Ferry? I did not know that. And did you know that the Hanover fuel stop um, is, uh, it's, I mean, very quickly becoming one of the most favorite places, uh, not only in East Ohio, but for the people over here uh, in the northern panhandle? Well, yeah, you could probably believe that because you got a taste of it this weekend. John, why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, that I do know. So uh, I have a friend who uh, is a food writer, Hal Klein with Pittsburgh Magazine, and I had read Steve's piece, your piece, um, at Lee News Actually, about how say, to I'm, I, John, excuse me. Mike Hughes wrote that story. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, I that's apologize. okay. I, just, I assigned <laughs> it to him. Um, <laughs> you know, but Mike Hughes, one of my writers, he wrote the Hanover story, and it did phenomenal, uh, phenomenally uh, analytics-wise. But I, ju- I did want to put well, Mike's uh, name out there because he wrote okay. the story. Thank you. Well, thanks to Mike, because I, I love a good sandwich. So um, I sent this piece to Hal, and Hal was like, we got to go. So we took the car and, uh, you know, taking COVID precautions, went down there, walked in, and it's like the size of a, a grocery store. It's this huge deli, and you can tell, like, there was a line, uh, even though it was like, you know, I mean, I guess uh, Saturday is, is a relatively busy day for a gas station. But anyway, there's a line, and they said on Fridays they had the fish sandwich, and you can't, you have to call in like eight hours ahead of time. That's right. If you want to get a sandwich. Yep. So. I, I can t- I can tell that it's a, it's a it's a special place, and you can tell it's a place where somebody cares about you know the quality of the food. So that that attracted me too. Yeah, and you know the quality of the food. You know what I I really like, and my buddy Doug Giffen, he is uh, the guy in charge of the IEBW. He's the president of I, uh, IBEW Local One Forty One. Um, he brought me a sandwich when he was a guest at one point several years ago, and he goes, "What do you want?" And I, and it was at this time of year, I believe it was on a Friday. So I said, uh, well, the, the tuna fish, you know, because I'm Catholic, John, uh, and I don't eat fish on Fridays. And, you know, we have a lot of Christians here. That's why you have to call the Hanover Fuel Stop so many hours before on Fridays because of the Lenten <laughs> season. Um, but I'm like, uh, yeah, if you want to grab, yeah, I'll, I'll try their tuna fish. And oh my goodness! How about the size of those hoagies, bro? You could you could uh, feed a family of four with one of those. In fact, you know they, they don't call them hoagies; they call them hoggies because yeah, they're for yeah. they're for hogs. <laughs> well, I, I'm not surprised about the historical point because I know the Ohio River was basically the route to explore the rest of America in the 18th century. So it makes sense that that spot might have been the first place people got to. Yeah, it, you know, I mean, Wheeling was here first, um, and of course, uh, then they went over to Ohio. We, you know, Wheeling uh, became, did you know <laughs> that Wheeling is the only municipality ever to serve as the capital city for two different states? Uh, I did not know that. I know it was the capital of uh, West Virginia in the uh, at the founding, correct? Yeah, yeah, 1863, um, and it, it remained... It was the capital of Virginia, and then, of course, it became the capital of uh, West Virginia. Uh, but, you know, West Virginia was here many moons um, before, and Martins Ferry is known as the first settlement, not the first municipality, but the first settlement 
because, you know, and people got across that Ohio River somehow, and they wanted to do their land claim, so they did it there. That, that makes sense, yeah. So um, Hal and I, we, uh, I got the Italian and the roast beef, and he got the tuna, by the way, uh, and somebody in line recommended it as the best sandwich there. So definitely tell your listeners that uh, you can't go wrong with tuna or roast beef or Italian. Well, you just did, John. You just did. Um, no, and, and the uh, steak hoagie or hoggy is, is uh, delicious. I've, I've not had a bad sandwich from the Hanover Fuel Stop, so I'm really happy that you guys... Uh, decided to do that road trip. I'm sorry, uh, it was Michelle's birthday weekend, but you know if we if lead produce you know does a story on something else that you guys are like we gotta go, <laughs> uh, I'll do my darndest to c- come join you because yeah I could have thrown down one of those hoagies on Saturday that's for sure but <laughs> but that's not where you stop uh, you didn't stop there you kept eating John. We kept that. Uh, this is the the the, uh, the danger of going on a, a road trip with a food writer is that they always want to take you to one more place. So he basically told me that the pizza west of New York was invented in Steubenville, Ohio, at this place called De Carlo's, which I know a lot of people have heard of. I hadn't. I had no idea. But a There's guy who's been the in the Carlos military. In Moundsville, man. <laughs> How many are there? I have no idea. Uh, let me think. See here in the valley, John. Uh, we, there's a constant conversation that, uh, that always goes on who had, which to Carlos is best. Um, when ah. I was in college, I really liked the Wellsburg, uh, to Carlos the best because one, it, it was an easy trip to go get, but it, it was a little different than what Elm Grove was. Uh, now Elm Grove, no longer to Carlos. Now it's known as Patsy's, but uh, there's one in student. <laughs> well, no, 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 John. It's Patsy's for a couple of reasons. A gentleman by the name of Patsy, um, he operated that store uh, along with his his family for a, a ton of years, and then finally said, "You know what?" I, and and he had the accent and everything. I can't do it, but he said, "You know what? It's time for me to retire." So his son <laughs> Joey decided to, you know changed the name from De Carlos and honor his father by naming it, naming it Patsy's. Uh, but there's a downtown De Carlos. There's uh, De Carlos down in Marshall <laughs> County. Uh, there's one up at the Highlands. Um, I, I, honestly, I don't know how many there are, but uh, there's that, like I said, that constant conversation, who has the best De Carlos pizza? Uh, Steve, is there anything that, that you don't know about the Ohio River Valley between Moundsville and Pittsburgh? Oh, I'm sure I learn every day, John. <laughs> I, I, I learn every day. Um, there's always something new to learn around here because of how old. Um, you know, like it's the true. city of Wheeling, it wasn't Wheeling when it was initially uh, founded by the Zane family. Uh, Ebenezer mm-hmm. Zane called it Zanesburg. Hmm. Yeah, and downtown Wheeling was a farm. And, there, and then and, it became one of the bit. I'm sorry? Bigger. And then it became one of the bigger cities in the country in the early 19th century. Oh, it competed against Pittsburgh for being, a, you know, a bigger and more important metropolitan uh, metropolitan area. But, you know, and then you you know that uh, Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel, it started as Pittsburgh Steel and Wheeling Steel, and then they merged. And when you come, and if you were in Steubenville and you went from um, Martins Ferry, you saw you've you've seen all the uh, decaying red giant warehouse buildings. Those used to be steel mill, the uh, steel mills. Yeah, amazing. I mean, the, the the industrial might of that part of the country just blows me away every time I, I, I learn about it or think about it. That you know, this fifty years ago was like you know the east coast of of China is today. Just you know, one of the five to six leading industrial centers in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you never know. You know, they're talking about this being a big natural gas place. Uh, We do have uh, hundreds of well pads in the three-county area, Marshall, Ohio, and Belmont County over in Ohio, or I meant the Ohio Valley. Um, You know, now, you know, there's a proposed cracker plant for Belmont County. Um, And, and, you know, and I'll say this out loud. I've said it many times. I, you know, I know there's environmental concerns, but if we get a cracker plant, then the plastic manufacturers are going to follow, and that industry 
the petrochemical industry could actually replace someday what steel was in the upper Ohio Valley. We'll see if that happens. It's been delayed several times. Um, but I know a lot of people, a lot of people are hoping that uh, that cracker plant, uh, which would be built by PTT Global America, uh, a lot of people hope that happens so we can finally reinvent uh, the economy here in the upper Ohio Valley. But you know a lot about the energy uh, history here in this area because for the Wall Street Journal, you covered a lot of topics concerning energy. Tell us about that, John. I did. So um, I uh, moved to Pittsburgh in 2011 from uh, Brussels, Belgium to cover uh, mining and metals for the Wall Street Journal. So that included everything from diamond mines in Africa to coal and yes, West Virginia, which dovetailed a bit with uh, doing gas coverage. And so learning about basically the, the industries that, you know, give us the things we use every day. So your car is uh, iron ore blasted out of the ground, melted into steel, you know, shaped into steel panels and built into a car with rubber that comes from petrochemicals that, um, you know, is, comes out of, uh, out of gas. And so all these things are connected. And, and you know, what I always said about mining is that, you know, these things always have a cost and try to minimize the environmental impact. But unless you want a world with no cars and no airplanes, and you're going to have some mining and, and some drilling for, for petroleum and gas, you just try to minimize the, uh, the bad environmental impact. And so I, I fell in love with Pittsburgh when I moved here. And then in 2016, when I left the Wall Street Journal, decided to make a, a movie about a, a small town that would kind of tell people about, you know, what a classic American industrial town is like. And for that project, I picked Moundsville, um, West Virginia, which in my mind is about, about as classic an industrial town um, as you can get. And so, um, you know, I spent a couple years in Moundsville and we reported on the, the cracker plant across the river, uh, which we ended up not putting in the movie because um, the economics don't line up to b start building it right now. Although I think it's clear in the long run, so thinking, you know, 20, 40, 50 years, that at some point that gas does get used and it does get used, you know, by factories because uh, it's just it's just so much of it and, and it's a world of declining resources and there it is in the ground and it's, it's cheaply available. And so you're going to have, you know, exploitation of that at some point. I just think in the short term, the economics right now don't line up. Um, but yeah, I, I love that job because I learned so much about, you know, where stuff comes from, which is sort of this elemental, you know, point of curiosity that I think a lot of journalists have. And then you created Moundsville.org, and uh, we've created a partnership between Moundsville.org and Lead News. Uh, so uh, before I go any further, John, I'm, I'm really happy that you reached out to me because, um, you know, it, like tonight, you know, all I'm going to say is you wrote about baseball. And it and it pertains to Moundsville. That's all I'm going to say. People are really enjoying your work. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I, I think, you know, I have friends all over the world uh, from my days at the Wall Street Journal and, and then living in Brussels before. And people love reading about Moundsville because it's so quintessentially American, you know, all the way back to you know, this Native American past. It's like really old, you know, to like the, the you know, white settlement in the 18th century and then the rise of industry. And then these like really interesting, quirky stories that I've been trying to do on, on the blog that just sort of capture like, you know, this rich small town life that, is, again, is so American. So many small towns are like Moundsville. So many people who see Moundsville see their own town. And I want to really like bring that alive and, and you know, give a lot of like, you know, life to these stories um, that are often not told by, by, by bigger, bigger newspapers. Right. They are. They are not. And that's because. I mean, John, you know, you've been in journalism for uh, a little while. You've seen journalism change tremendously since you got the gig, um, you know, in, in Brussels with the Wall Street Journal. Then you got transferred to America. You've seen, you've seen the change in journalism. Tell us about that. Um, well, I mean, at, at the, the very basic element, it's just there's a lot, 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 um, a lot less money in journalism because people aren't reading newspapers as much and um, they're spending their time online. So that's where the advertisers are, are going. And you know, w with dwindling resources, it just means it's a lot harder to cover stuff. So like in Pittsburgh, where I live, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette just got rid of its Friday edition and is now that down, I think, two or three you know, print editions a week, right. but you know, and a lot of talent, a lot of talent, um, as in other industries, a lot of talent is leaving 
And so local journalism has just gotten whacked by this advertising crisis, um, you know, leaving people like you to like fill in the gaps with your venture, which I think is fantastic, by the way. Lead News is, is really wonderful. Um, and, you know, I, I, uh, I, I don't cover um, national politics. And I think one thing that's really important is to tell people that, you know, uh, there are big newspapers that cover national politics and, and people should read those to learn about national politics. But there's a whole world of life that happens away from Washington, D.C. that is right there that is worth covering and worth writing about and worth reading about. Um, and so in this crisis of, of, of journalism, which I mentioned before, which is the dwindling resources, that's, that stuff's gotten lost. And I think it's distracted everybody um, because they're, they're paying so much more attention to, you know, celebrity stuff or national politics instead of like what's happening in their own backyard, which is just as interesting and is more relevant to their own lives. Uh, and so this local journalism crisis, you know, I wanted to sort of make a dent in it with the Moundsville project and show people that there's still lots of great local stories worth telling and not just show people in this part of the country, but model it for the rest of the country. And so, you know, as I've screened the movie, I've also given talks about how great journalism is basically about individuals going and, and collecting stories and, and then telling them, you know, it's not that complicated. And you can only tell a story one word at a time, uh, despite all the bells and whistles and the, the apps and TikToks and Instagrams. A story is just still one word at a time. <laughs> and so if people who know how to tell stories just go out and do it. You know, then you have journalism. It doesn't have to be like a, a big company or a big institution. You can have it with one person and, w- and one website. Very true. And, uh, you know, uh, starting lead news, um, you know, and, and right on it, and I know that you cited it in something that you wrote, but, you know, right from the beginning, uh, you know, my attitude was I'm not going to compete against newspapers you know I, I i've worked for newspapers i've been a publisher of newspapers and things like that but you know i i'm i'm not gonna have the police reports in the on lead i'm not gonna you know cover everything i, I break a lot of news but i'm more interested in the character of this upper ohio valley so that's that's what this podcast is all about that's what lead news is all about and as it says on the website you know, we're a complement, not a competitor, to the other media outlets here in the Upper Ohio Valley. I don't want to compete against the TV stations or or the newspapers and things like that. That's not my intention. I want to give people journalism they no longer get. Stories. Yeah. And people love people love people love stories. Like when I do a piece uh, on the blog, it, it'll get a few thousand readers. You know, for a- town that has 8,000. So to me, that shows you there's an appetite. I'm sure you see the same thing. When you do something like that sandwich piece, you know, people love that and they want it and they're not getting it right now. And, you know, with that empty space, you know, then they're, they're sort of drifting into, you know, looking at stuff online that's not well reported and it's not real news. Well, some people like to call that fake news. And uh... <laughs> I don't like to use those words. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, I had to start the Sunday series, the the satires, fake news, and (laughs) this past week, or last week, I should say, I I wrapped myself into one because, you know, I wrote the the Sunday piece. It comes out at 7 o'clock, and it was about a ghost in in a former asylum, (laughs) and I got a bunch of notes. You can't stop. (laughs) You have to finish this. So well, that I, so that I was, did. That, that was that was that was that was brilliant because it, it was so outrageous. It made the point that you know people like you and me, Steve, like we never make stuff up because you get fired in journalism for making stuff up. And so I think I hope people respect like the integrity of like people who have worked in newspapers and tell stories. Like you know, I've not made up a fact in my life. You know, and, and it's something that's like it's the essence of our profession. And so by doing that satire, I, I felt like you ennobled journalism in a way and i appreciate that well and and i appreciate that uh you know that that insight because yeah that was part of the the motivation um i i'm not going to do that with every fake news sunday story um (laughs) but you know i mean if if you get 10 or 20 notes that says steve you can't finish this we have to know where the ghost's home is (laughs) you know and i'm like okay 
And, uh, you know, I, and I played off history. Those story, you know, that, that series, it ended up to be four installations. That series told a ton of history about this area while also involving a, a ghost. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, like uh, the, the, the character of the sheriff, um, Tom, uh, Howard Thomas, the sheriff's real name, by the way, is Tom Howard. Um, you know, he said it a couple of times, you know, I'm pretty sure we're the first law enforcement agency ever to deal with a case like this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it was just, lot, it was a little bit of fun. A lot of, a lot of ghosts in the Ohio Valley. You listen, man, one of your favorite places, the West Virginia Penn. Um, you know, there's, there are a lot of photographs and if you see the photographs, um, it, it's going to help you really believe that there's something in that big giant Gothic building. It's one of the top paranormal investigation sites in the country. Yeah. People go there from all over the country to go looking for ghosts. Yeah. And TV shows are there. I mean, Netflix did a thing there. Um, I was having a conversation over the weekend, and someone's like, you know, I really want to take the tour. And I said, if you do, ask when Chuck works, because Chuck is a former guard when it was still an operating prison. And uh, he'll definitely take you into the sugar shack and into the infirmary, <laughs> because those are the two places where most of the paranormal activity reportedly take place. Don't mess with Chuck. That's what I hear. Yeah, that's right. Um, but <laughs> the the infirmary, of course, is you know the the prison hospital. The sugar shack was actually a recreation room for the prisoners with no supervision. John, that's where things got ugly. It, it was pretty violent. To. Yeah. If they needed to. It, 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 it was. Uh, I mean, it, it was violent, and it was. Uh, it was rough. Like, you know, it gets romanticized, but it's an awful place to have lived as a human being. Like they packed those guys in like sardines. Oh, it was overcrowded for years, for years. And, but it, you know what, what I found, and, and, and this is a, um, this will be in the, in the piece tonight is that it was integrated into the community in a way that was human, that the guys could get yeah. out and they would work on, they work on projects. And there was a kind of like, it was part of the community. You know, it wasn't like, us and them. It was like, these guys are going to live here for like five, 10 years. And um, let's see how we can get them to help out. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And you didn't give too much away, John. So thanks. Um, all <laughs> right. Now tell us about the movie Moundsville, how folks can watch it. And then I'll let you get back. So Moundsville is on PBS, which means that it's available on the, the PBS app. So on the Roku or whatever kind of device you use, you can also go to pbs.org and just enter Moundsville and you'll find it. Or you can go to moundsville.org um, and get the director's cut for a few dollars um, just by clicking on buy rent. Um, so that's again, moundsville.org or pbs.org. All right. Very, very cool. And of course, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it'll be in uh, this evening's story that comes out at 7 p.m. John, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. I love your insight. And uh, hopefully in the future, you'll be able to come on back and talk about some of the stories that you have published um, on Moundsville.org, okay? Anytime. Uh, happy to talk journalism, baseball, Moundsville, anything. Oh, maybe, we'll uh, maybe we'll have to talk a little, ba a little <laughs> baseball in the future. How does that sound? That'd be a delight, yeah. All right. Thank you, John. Appreciate it very much. You take Thanks. care. We'll talk soon, okay? Thanks, Steve. Bye-bye. I appreciate it. That's uh, John W. Miller of Moundsville.org. We'll go ahead and take the break. Brandon and Melissa Holmes, they went to Martin's Ferry to grab something. They ended up with a whole new store. I'll go ahead and let them tell that story here in a moment. I'm Steve Novotny. It is Steve Novotny Lives right here on Lead News. Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. It is 43 degrees here in, uh, well, East Wheeling, uh, pretty close to downtown. Uh, tonight, they are saying snow showers maybe around this evening, a low of 20 uh, degrees, but clearing skies after midnight. Winds will be 15 to 25 uh, miles per hour. Chance of that snow about 60%. And then tomorrow, sunny skies, a high of 42, and uh, winds 5 to 10 out of the west. 
And tomorrow night, clear skies, a low of 29 degrees. Let's go to Martin Sperry, Ohio, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and uh, join my good friends Brandon and Melissa Holmes. Hi, guys. Hi, Steve. Now, uh, uh, you're going to tell the story um, about how this new business started. But first, I haven't seen you guys in a little while. How's everybody doing? How's the family? We are we are all hanging in here, uh, hanging in there, I guess, as, as it were. And all the places. All, all the places. Uh, we've got uh, this kind of exciting new business that I, that I guess we're here to talk about, the uh, – the kids are doing well, and they are w- whenever they're able to be in school, they are very happy to be there. And we're well, very happy to have them. Yes. Oh, heck yeah. Now, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, Brandon is uh, a rare bird is what I'm going to say here in the upper Ohio Valley. And before we get into the new business, I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you why I refer to my friend Brandon as a rare bird. Watch this. Hey, Brandon. Uh huh. Summer's coming. Uh, yeah. I my my seasonal depression is kicking in pretty hard uh, right about now. I'm not happy about shedding lips. <laughs> now that that is like the major difference between you and I. You know that I crave summer, and you just he, you hate it. I, I I'm not. You know, I like I like going to the beach. I like going to the beach when it's frozen. I like going to the beach when it's hot. Um, but uh, I, I'd prefer if if I if I rarely saw it get above about seventy degrees, I'd be a pretty happy man. And I think I'm fortunate in, in that Melissa shares that with me. Yeah, you're very very fortunate. And here, here's a quick story, and then we'll get to the biz. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, go with friends and go down to Myrtle Beach in January. Uh, Michelle and I turned that down because. I think it would make me cry if I saw it snow at a beach. It, it's it, well, I don't know. Again, you know, I'm I'm, I'm the crazy one here, but uh, we, Melissa and I went uh, last weekend, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, up to Lake Erie to get the last of the lake freeze in. And whenever the lake freeze is over, I don't know if you know this, but the the waves form large ice dunes, so you can actually walk uh, quite a bit of ways uh, safely uh, before the freeze ends out onto the lake. And where the normal beach level is, you're standing on about 10 feet of ice. And, uh, oh, and wow. it's kind of magical. I, you know, Brandon, I did not know that. That sounds pretty cool. It's, it's, it's an incredibly cool phenomenon. You can sort of see where the ice has bunched, bunched itself up. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, the lighthouses get all covered in ice and uh, it's it's pretty neat to see. It's definitely you've got to you've got to take your big coat, but uh, but it, it's it's we try to do it uh, every year if we possibly can. Okay. It's like freezing. Last year it freeze. Last year the lake did not freeze. We didn't we didn't get there. Uh, and and Lake Erie is actually the shallowest of the Great Lakes, so it will sometimes freeze like all the way across or almost all the way across. Really? Wow, that's incredible. What happens to the fish? They go to like a little pool at the bottom and try to survive. I, yeah, I think they're in, in a pool at the bottom. You know, of course, it's not frozen, you know, all the way down to the to the bed of the lake. And so I guess they go out in the middle. And, and actually, uh, particularly if you get closer, um, uh, more more east, closer up towards Buffalo, the lake is shallower there, so it freezes thicker. And there will be giant ice fishing camps out on the horizon. And you can see, you'll drive past these parks, and there's a ton of vehicles and there's like no one there and you're like this is the middle of winter what's going on here and suddenly you realize that people are on atvs and side by sides and snowmobiles getting out of their truck they're loading giant coolers full of beer and ice fishing equipment and they're driving out on the ice out towards miles out to these ice fishing camps where they'll hang out and they'll they'll go ice fishing and uh and camp out there it's it's, those fires out there it's terrifying it's it's terrifying. Even even we're not even quite that devoted. No, I mean from uh, you know I I have expressed interest to friends to ice fish sometimes because I do enjoy uh, you know fishing. I think it'd just be kind of neat <laughs> to be in a to be in one of those uh, fishing shanties with some kind of heat. Yes, 
but pulling out walleye and whatever you pull out of, uh, you know, one of the Great Lakes. I think that'd be a lot of fun. I, I think, you know, I, I think it probably would. And, and having seen some of these rigs that these guys tow out there, um, the, the accommodations can be pretty posh. Uh, you know, um, and so so it's not. I, I don't spend think a lot of money on these setups. It's pretty impressive. It's not. It's probably not your grandpappy's wooden shed out on the ice. Well, that, I think that's what I would prefer, as long as there was some heat. All right, let's get to the new business. You guys tell the story. Well, first, number one, Melissa, tell me the name of the business and what you're doing in Martins Ferry, Ohio. We are Ready, Aim, Fire, Ceramic Studio, and um, soon to be GIF. Uh, right now, we are just working on the ceramic side and picking out our inventory as far as the gifts go. Um, I'm actually sitting and cleaning greenware to fire, so folks have little bunnies and chicks and butterflies and Easter eggs to paint. I'm doing that right now. Yeah, I saw your post earlier. Uh, I think the Easter eggs are a terrific idea. Uh, I think they're going to be very, very popular. Now, one of y'all tell us the story about, I mean, you went to Martin's Ferry to buy something, and all of a sudden, here you are with the newest business in downtown Martin's Ferry. Tell us the story. We actually didn't even leave the kitchen for this. For this. <laughs> I didn't, we didn't leave the kitchen. We may, we may have been laying in bed, as a matter of fact. Um, so, Melissa had had done ceramics as a child uh this kind of you know poured molded ceramics and painted them and things and uh and it's something she kind of got me and and the kids are really into we paint them around christmas time and she's really been looking for uh, some kind of a setup to to get back into doing it you know even uh just pour pour our own and and fire our own you fire it in a kiln just like you do a, a pot that was thrown on a wheel and uh, we started to get into it towards the end of last year because COVID has largely had our other business, Renew Refinishing and Restoration, um, shut down just because of supply issues and things. And so we came across a kiln and we came across some molds uh, out of a, of an, a ceramic shop that had shut down down in Bel Air. And uh, so she put out an ad for vintage style ceramic Christmas trees. And that really blew up. They say it's Christmas. They, sa- they saved Christmas, and I think they made a lot of other people's Christmas. Uh, we sold a lot of those, and we started thinking, gee, we really need to get a second kiln. This is this is really going. We're doing this in our basement, which is like where we start all our businesses, I guess. Right, right. And we're, we're laying in bed, and we had been checking on Marketplace for a kiln, and we both said, you know, what about Craigslist? Nobody, nobody, nobody goes to Nobody shops on Craigslist anymore. Look on Craigslist. And I look on Craigslist, and I scroll down to, like, the third ad, and I read it. And I lean over to Melissa and I show her the phone. I say, well, do you want to buy an entire ceramics business? Because the ad that I had come across searching ceramic kiln uh, came up with an advertisement for uh, an entire ceramics business for sale. And I wasn't actually looking at him and I got really angry with him because I thought he was being a prankster, as you can't imagine he would ever do. And I thought he was joking, like, that's a really terrible thing to joke about. He's like, no, look, so we're looking for kilns, and instead of kilns, we found an entire turnkey business with two kilns. So then we met with the nice lady who um, owned the business, which was uh, Jan Ceramic Fever, and made a deal with her, and here we are. <laughs> All right, here so... You said, you're, I mean, Renew is still a business, but because of the pandemic, it's been really difficult for you guys to, you know, go to auctions, go to homes, go to warehouses and things like that, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah, it's still still in business. We are not, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not taking in any new work right now because we're very far behind. And one of the big problems, Steve, was we were not able to get our safety equipment, our personal protective equipment, because, of course, any kind of mask of any type at all uh, really became a rare commodity about this time last year. And we need those types of things to protect us uh, from uh, from dust and, and from lead and other contaminants that are in old finishes. 
and we weren't able to get those and that really uh that really put a dent on us being able to operate with that renew i got you i got you so is that melissa is that what i tell uh, my son michael about his bar stool um i can actually paint michael's bar stools because there's not a lead there's not a lead component um so those those can come in we can do we Basically, we can do paint finish, and we might be able to look at some uh, modern type stuff, but we're so far behind that we can't take any actual full refinishing work. We're unable to do any of that. At this yeah, point. no, I get it. I get it. All right, now, tell tell me in, where in Martins Ferry is this uh, new ceramics business? So our, our, our uh, new, new to us ceramics business, uh, it's actually been here for, I think, almost 30 years. We're at 415 Hanover Street in Martins Ferry. And for those who don't know, Hanover is the uh, sort of the main street coming up uh, the middle of Martins Ferry from Route 7. It's right at the, the, the turn where you would turn if you were going to McDonald's and you go two blocks up, you pass where the new Belmont Brew Works is, and we are on the left-hand side of the road right before the toy store. Deluxe Toy and Hobby. We're between McDonald's and Deluxe Toy and Hobby. Oh, so you're right across from McDonald's. We're not right across from McDonald's. We're about a block further up. Yep. Interesting. Okay. Um, so tell me about it. I mean, what, what has the reception been pretty good? Wow. The, uh, the re- I would say the reception has been great. Um, uh, all around, we've got some folks, uh, we got the keys a week, um, a little over a week, a little ago. Over a week ago. I think we're about maybe on day, day 12 or something like that. And as soon as we were here, of course, we got the keys and ran over and, uh, kind of looking around like oh wow this is ours and my daughter Callie was with us and, and she was sort of bouncing up and down with excitement and uh immediately as people started coming by I don't know if it was that night was it was, I think I believe it might have been actually been that night or the next night we were over here and people saw that there were lights on and stopped in and got really excited people who were former customers uh the business had been open, but Jan uh, was not feeling very well. And so hours were kind of sporadic and people have really, um, you know, we've got, I think we've got about 600 likes on our Facebook page and there are people sending us messages about how happy they are that we're opening back up, that it's going to be a ceramic store. Uh, it's going to be regularly open again. And uh, so that the community uh, embracement has been really great. And, uh, and we've also, we had about an hour conversation with John Davies, the Martins Ferry mayor last week, uh, who we had reached out to just saying, you know, hey, what, what do we have to do to, to, you know, make everything right uh, as far as doing business in the city? And he was really great about giving us the lowdown on the business climate here and welcoming us. I think, I think he said welcome uh, probably a half dozen times in a, like a 45 minute conversation. I think you're right. Really? And where we all ship so we've already been shipping all over the country as fast as i can box things they're they're going out so i think shipping is going to be a really local business is so important but in a time like this where a lot of folks are really nervous about things shipping is a very big component of our business okay all right and so you're saying across the country already huh yes well, that's impressive. Now, I mean, I know you didn't plan on this, but what's it, I mean, what's that tell you about the demand that's out there, for goodness sake? We're in the right place at the right time. Um, this is something, you know, it's, it's not a new hobby, but people are really starting to get back into it. It's something that folks enjoy um, as far as the old ceramic Christmas trees you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who doesn't have a memory surrounding one of those. Right. Um, and it's just, it's always people's stories are great. Even if it's something that they don't do, they have a story to tell. Oh, I painted this with my grandmother. Oh, my grandmother had this. I, you know, people will see pictures of something you can come paint on Facebook and message. Hey, can, how much is this? Can I come pick this up? I painted this with my dad. I want to make another one. Yeah, I can remember uh, there was a ceramic place 
in my uh, old neighborhood when I uh, was being raised uh, in Woodsdale, it was it was along Edgington Lane, right across from where Michaelis Meat Market is. It's Lorraine Medical, uh, Medical Supply now. Um, but in that first building on the right, if you are staring at the front of uh, Lorraine Medical, um, the far right area was once a old school confectionery. Uh, and, you know, you could get your root beer floats and this and that and everything else that a confectionery used to sell. And then it became something of a ceramics place. And every kid in the neighborhood wanted to paint something. Uh, so, you know, we all went, and that was a lot of fun. I know there was a, a similar business down in Center Market for a little while. I'm not sure if it's still there. Um, but, yeah, Melissa, I agree with you completely. We all have some kind of memory, at our age anyway, some kind of memory of... Uh, you know, painting something or, you know, doing something ceramic. Or even see, you know, seeing, you know, go to grandma's house and, and it was something that they put out every holiday, things like that. And we'll, well be yeah. doing, um, as COVID sort of passes and things, as things resolve and things change, we will also be doing um, paint and sips and parties. We can do parties. Here, or we can do parties on site, say, you know, you have a, a kid's birthday party at a park. We can come out and bring little frogs for all of them to paint, things like that, sort of lead classes, that sort of thing. Okay. Now, you mentioned Mayor John Davies. Um, you know, he, he was elected last year. Uh, he's very interactive, very involved with the economic development and the services in the city of Martins Ferry. Um you know, and, and Brandon, if I remember correctly, you told me that when you had that conversation with Mayor Davies, he wanted to know how he could help. Not that something was wrong, not that, you know, anything like that. But he wanted to know, what can I do for you to make you more comfortable in the city of Martins Ferry? Tell us about that. That was really, and that, he, he really reiterated that over and over again. Um, and fortunately, uh, we, we haven't had to call on him for any assistance uh, other than, than just sort of getting the lay of the land. But it was really, uh, it was really great and, and really different from some other things that we've experienced. You know, uh, the, the old the old adage that, that you know, the, the I'm from the, what, what, how's it go? I'm from the government and I'm here to help. That's when you when you get scared, but, uh, but I think in this case, it, I think John really means it. He, uh, he reiterated how committed uh, the city of Martins Ferry is to helping businesses in the city, promoting businesses. You know, they just got the hospital back open uh, a few weeks ago and um, trying to, trying to get storefronts filled. Uh, we, we're, we're happy to be able to, to bring new life back to this storefront. Um, we've got an empty storefront that is right beside us that uh, I, I don't, know if i can announce uh what's going in there but we've been told that something new and exciting is going to go in there um right around the corner here we've got belmont brew works which uh which i think that a lot of folks um in town and, and really enjoy really enjoy and are really excited to have here um so there's there's some there are things happening uh here in in a, in a small town and uh and it really seems as though the city is behind uh doing doing more than just giving lip service but really I think genuinely saying, what can we do to help you be as successful as possible? They try to make a lot of connections between the different businesses in town so that everybody can can help everybody out. And you know, we've got a hardware, Ferry Hardware is right around the corner. And we've been trying to do as much business with them as we can and uh, and really, you know, be a part of the community as we've tried. And, and I think with some success to be a part of the business community in Wheeling. And, uh, and it's, I guess it's really exciting on our part to get to do both. Right, right, right. Yeah, and Mayor Davies was really sort of showed a really, a really great commitment, not just to you know your 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 big corporate, uh, big corporate type businesses coming in like East Ohio coming in, but really talking with us about what we're doing and how that might mesh with what they're doing and how we could be more successful, you know, doing things that that benefit folks who are working or staying at the hospital, um, how the city tries to 
do a lot of its purchasing with local businesses. Um, just really, it was it was it was a really refreshing and positive conversation. Down to he even made sure that we know where to go in person to pay our deposit to for, for our water service, where all of the utilities are, and when we can come in, he's in the office every day. Just it was. It was really he. He seems very, very all in and very, very present. It was it was a really great conversation. All right, name of the business location one more time, and I'm going to let you get back to work. Okay, it is Ready Aim Fire Ceramic Studio. Uh, we are on Facebook under that name, and we're at 415 Hanover Street in Martin's Ferry. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Good luck. I'll be over uh, soon to see uh, what you guys have all set up and what you're selling. Okay. We, we'd love to have you, and thanks, Steve. All thanks, right, Steve. thank you. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, Brandon and Melissa Holmes. Brand new business over in Martins Ferry. All right, that'll do it for us, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, again, it's supposed to get down to about 20 degrees this evening and maybe a, a flurry or two, but bright sunny, uh, sunny day tomorrow, a high of 42. I'll be back on Wednesday. Um, let's see, what are we going to do Wednesday? Uh, on Wednesday, I have a couple of guests, including Mr. John Banco and his liner notes segment. So until then, God bless you, folks. We'll talk again.
face right now. Very true. Very <laughs> true. All right, we'll take the break. We'll be back in just a few minutes. It's Steve Novotny Lives right here on Weed News. <laughs> 